John Medcroft. I'm lecturing public policy at King's College London and I'm the editor of this book, Prohibitions, published by the Institute of Economic Affairs. Well, Prohibitions is a book about the outlaw of the manufacture, sale and distribution of different goods and services by consenting adults. The book principally examines the prohibition of 10 goods and services. Uh, that somewhere in the world are prohibited or heavily restricted, and in some cases in large parts of the world. And those ten goods and services are recreational drugs, boxing, firearms, advertising, pornography, prostitution, uh, medical drugs and devices, gambling, human body parts for transplant, and alcohol. And there's basically two central arguments in the book. The first argument is that it's morally wrong for the state to prevent people from using their bodies as they wish. It's argued that each individual has a property right in themselves and that property right cannot be legitimately infringed by anybody else, including the government. So when the government stops an individual from choosing to drink alcohol, to gamble or to take cocaine for example, they're infringing that person's right of self-ownership their right to choose what to do with their own bodies. The second argument in the book concerns the practical consequences of prohibition. And here it's argued that on practical grounds it's a mistake for the government to prohibit these activities because of the costs and benefits that follow. And in the introduction to the collection I outline six principal costs or consequences of prohibition. The first one is that prohibition places markets into the hands of criminal, criminal enterprises. So prohibition drives a wedge between the cost of production and the final selling price. And that means that those willing to supply illegal goods and services can reap exceptional profits. One example of this was the uh, Colombian drug cartel run by Pablo Escobar. In 1989, Forbes magazine in America listed Pablo Escobar as the seventh richest, richest man in the world and his medal in drug cartel had an annual income of 80 billion dollars at that time. The second consequence of prohibition is that it increases the risk of already risky activities. So by shifting the supply of goods and services into the black market under the control of criminal organisations prohibition greatly increases the risk of already risky activities. So for example, in those countries like Norway and Cuba where boxing is illegal, organised fights still take place. But those fights take place without the fighters having access to proper or quick medical care. And that also increases the risks of serious injury. The third consequence of prohibition is that it criminalises people who would not otherwise be criminals. So prohibition involves the creation of what we might call consensual crimes. So people who otherwise would obey the law become criminals because things that they wish to do and have done in the past perhaps have become illegal. The fourth consequence of prohibition is that it diverts law enforcement resources away from crimes with third party victims to these consensual crimes. So the enforcement of any prohibition involves a substantial direct financial cost. One example of this would be the annual budget of the US uh, Drug Enforcement Administration, the, the central US body that uh, prohibits drugs. That annual budget in 2006 was $2.4 million. And a separate cost of the state police, customs, the Coast Guard and court time also spent enforcing the war on drugs. So prohibition then fuels the growth of government bureaucracies. It means that taxes are higher than they would otherwise be. The fifth consequence of prohibition is that it, it increases public ignorance. It's often argued that governments should prohibit act activities because people don't have the information to judge. This is perhaps a, a perverse argument, given that prohibition by, by its nature enhances or increases public ignorance. So if people are going to take recreational drugs, drink alcohol, gamble, smoke tobacco, engage in prostitution or boxing, what they really need is good information about the risks involved and prohibition makes that information harder to obtain. 
The sixth and final consequence of prohibition is that it almost never works, and it's almost always counterproductive. Some of the costs described above might be worthwhile if we actually did prohibit the activities we want to prohibit, but that tends not to be what happens. So for example, cannabis has been uh, de facto illegal in the US since 1937. It's been de facto legal in Holland since 1970, and today it's freely available in, in the Netherlands in coffee shops and so forth. However, in 1997, the proportion of the US population, the American population, aged 12 years and over, who had used cannabis in their lifetime, was 32.9%. In Holland, by contrast, the proportion of the population who had used, used cannabis was 15.6%. So the, the 36 year war on drugs in America has had no discernible impact on drug use. Or precisely, its impact has been perverse. That is, drug use in America is higher than in Europe where, drugs, where the same drugs have been legal. To conclude, I would point out that one can believe that something is morally wrong and also believe that it should be legal. It's simply that one believes that moral choices should be an individual matter for people to take privately rather than something that government imposes from above. It is a belief that if we give people responsibility, they will act responsibly. That, I believe, is the basis of a free society. So Dr. Medicroft, can you tell us why it is that prohibition almost never works? Sure. I think there are, there are three main reasons. Uh, the first is that people engage in offsetting behaviour. That is, they find ways around the law. So we see that when tobacco, the price of tobacco increases, people engage in smuggling and counterfeiting. When the price of alcohol increases, people engage in smuggling of alcohol. So people engage in offsetting behaviour is the first reason. Secondly, I think that for prohibition to work, it requires a level of government, government interference in people's lives that is not acceptable in a free society. I think, for example, the Taliban have done a good job of making alcohol illegal in Afghanistan, if you like, of prohibiting alcohol. But unless we're prepared to go around shooting people for having alcohol, I think it's very hard to make it work. And the third reason, in many ways the most important, is that prohibition addresses the symptoms, not the causes, of social problems. So if we take firearms from people, they'll just find another way to kill, to kill one another, if that's what they want to do. The real challenge really is to address the causes of social problems, rather than just look to uh, tackle the symptoms. If prohibition doesn't work, what should government do? Sure, I don't think I'm arguing here for, if you like, a free-for-all, where we have recreational drugs available in news agents where anybody at all can buy them, including children. I think the role for government is to provide some kind of regulatory framework, rather than like we have for the sale of alcohol. And that may involve age restrictions on the sale of certain goods and services, it may involve other restrictions that we want to impose.